perfectly honest. I just had to re-record this intro because I actually just went through the interview that you're about to go through in just a second and it is really good. John Romanello is someone that I highly respect highly look up to. I just think he's a great dude, but God damn it, he is one of the world's best when it comes to actually being able to use words to influence people. And when it comes to you being able to build your business, especially being able to separate yourself from your competition, being able to attract in the right types of people, being able to actually get people to buy your stuff, knowing that you are the right choice for them, you need to listen to what John has. So I'm really excited for you to be able to go through this interview. I'd love to hear from you after this interview. So jump on the Instagram. My handle is at Chris Dufay. I'd love to know that you've enjoyed this episode or if you've got any feedback. And I'd love to know what you're actually going to be able to put into play with this because this is not just about more information. This is actually about what you're going to be able to do to build your business through the use of words. Virtually, you're paying for the experience. You're not just paying for access to your yes, your yes, and everything. yes. So I just wonder, like, what you know? Will there be an option? Like, you can stay at home and live wherever you live in Bali or wherever, and you can get your Harvard degree online, mm -hmm. and you maybe you pay, you know, twenty thousand a year instead of the sixty thousand a year because the sixty thousand a year you're not just it's yeah you're getting room and board, but you're also paying for the college experience. You're paying for all the other people there. You're paying for the parties and the quad and the frisbee and, you know, the late nights. And for some people, maybe it's, so I wonder how these industries respond after the fact when you've removed the, the illusion of it being a, a, a certain way by necessity. That's the thing I, I'm excited about to kind of sit here and, and wonder like, how are they going to handle things going forward? And then, you know, on a more individual level, things that's exciting for me is helping people write books, helping people figure out how mm -hmm. to say what they're going to say. So many people have time on their hands mm -hmm. and they're, they want to know how to use it effectively and they want to do something with the writing and helping them do that is exciting. And uh, it's, it's interesting that I, I really tried to shift my business more toward teaching and less toward coaching. Yep. Um, and so I was like, I'm going to do workshops. I'm like, you show up, I teach for eight hours and then I'm done and I'll see you when I see you. Yeah. And that was going great. And then this happened and I'm like, now I got to work with people long-term. <laughs> that's, it's like, it's fine if I like them, but yep. it's just, it, it definitely is either, you know, you work with a bunch of people at a reasonable price and you make a lot of money that way, or you work with a few people mm. at a higher price and you like do okay that way. But you know, it just, it's forced me to be like, all right, well, if I want to have shit, that's just like easy. I'm, now I gotta like, I'm like creating some low price courses and making it easy that way. Just like, okay, something that's like three yeah. bucks that I could just announce and be like everybody buy this yep. <laughs> and yep. that kind of shit and then yep. you know that way i can keep doing like ten thousand dollar packages and whatnot that's interesting what's in yeah, it's really it, what's what's most exciting to me is watching it all happen and speculating and and people getting um people revealing themselves in a mm. way that i think is is really interesting i'm i'm very much like in the i'm 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 participating in all of it mm. but i'm also as just a historian i'm very curious mm. and um yeah and it's also you i think when you when you have a lot of time like this you get to know yourself in a in a different way and see what's important and oh, fuck, yeah there's a, like I, wow i I don't do the things that I was doing and I like miss a lot of them, but some of them I don't. And yeah. It's interesting. So yeah, I mean, business wise, excited to like put stuff out there for consumption. And I'm really excited that everyone is producing more sort of personal content than pure business right now. So what do you think is the, I don't know, if I kind of turn it on the other side of this for yourself, what kind of like, what comes out the other side? Do you know what I mean? Like what's the positives and what's the negatives and what's the changes and what's the not going back to normal? I'm probably going to keep cooking as much as I have been. That it's, it's like it would forced me to realize that there were a lot of very simple changes in terms of the way that I live my life day to day that I could have made a lot sooner that, are better for everyone, myself included. And the simple example is paper towels. Being 
made aware that paper goods are in scarcity and it is difficult to come by them, despite having ordered not a, like a, not hoarding, but a reasonable stock, yep. I, I'm being more solicitous with my use of it. And just a, an easy way to navigate was, all right, well, now I got like three or four dish towels that I'll use to dry my hands. And I didn't realize how many rolls of paper towels I must have gone through in a given month or a given year, just drying my hands after having washed them. And stuff like that is just being brought to my attention. And the amount of money that Amanda and I spent like eating out or ordering food was tremendous. Yep. And, <clears throat> um, and it, 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 it just cooking more and not doing like meal prep for like six days. I don't do that. I just mm. like cook every day. And it's mm. like now part of my day and my routine and I like it. And so the things I'm going to take from this are just being a little bit more conscious of like the three hours of my day that I was just like, doing nothing with and now it, they don't have to be productive in that they move the needle for my life or my business forward they just get me through the day in a way that is just more engaged um, oh i love that so i think that's so important like I, I i personally have to reflect on that and say that is something that i need more of do you know because it's it's yeah. a trap that i know that i've fallen into where it's like well if i'm not doing something that gets and ROI, do you know what I mean? Then I shouldn't be doing that and I'm not doing something productive, but I'm like, yeah, <laughs> yeah like yeah, that's yeah. <laughs> stupid <laughs> entrepreneurship. Uh, yeah, it gets in your head, you know, and it's like, well, the ROI of, of cooking is, <laughs> 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 it's, like, that, it's allowed to, it's allowed to be that. <laughs> and it's great. <laughs> and it's like, but I enjoyed the process of making this steak and like, yeah. just sort of, you know, kind of, um, it, it being like a real, um, just sort of, you know, like a conversation with men, like, all right, well, what do we want to eat tonight? This is what we have. This is what I can, I, I do all the cooking, yep. um, which was never a conversation. It's just what happened. And it's lovely. And I, I love it. It's really cool. And what do you love cooking? What's like, what's the dish you're really enjoying cooking now? Uh, so I've branched out, whereas historically I'm, I will make meat and then something that is just goes with meat. And <laughs> whereas, uh, you know, now I'm just like, well, what do like, I, I, you know, you, you just live as a bodybuilder for so long. You get, you have all this stuff that runs in the background. I'm like, well, I can't just have a pasta dish. Like who would do that? No <laughs> and now I'm sort of unre it's 20 years later. I'm like, I can just make some fucking pasta. Um, and just interesting things like that. Uh, so, but salads and, and shit, the shit that I'm like, I don't want to make a salad. I'll just get sweet green or whatever. Yep. I'm just like, okay, I'll make a salad. Uh, but I honestly, I really, I really enjoy the basics. I just like having, you know, we're, we're very lucky that uh, our friend Anya Ferald has uh, a restaurant and meat company called Belcampo Meat Company. So we're able to get it from there and it gets delivered, which is nice. And so we have a ton of meat. Just, uh, you know, having, just being able to have like incredibly ethically raised, ethically slaughtered, organic, grass fed beef be delivered mm. and to just cook a couple of steaks. It's nice. It's nice. And, I, you know, it doesn't have to be complicated. I, I, re I also realize I, I do not eat enough food. And that is <laughs> when I was in the bodybuilder stuff, I'm like, I, I briefly thought about count, starting to count macros again. And all that's going to tell me is I probably under eat by a thousand calories. Yeah. <laughs> I was like, I was just like a, and then some days I'm just like, oh, I'm gonna make that up with with jelly beans and chocolate. And I'll yeah, because like, I can justify. Yeah. Well, it's because I don't even realize it. It's like some days I'm having 1,200 calories and it's all meat and veggies, and then yep. the next day it's like 1,200 calories of meat and veggies plus a thousand calories of jelly beans. Yeah, <laughs> like jelly beans are not not a food group apparently. <laughs> um, but it's it, yeah, I just. Um, the hardest thing that I miss over, I real, I will have a new appreciation mm -hmm. for the availability of everything, and yeah. in particular, training. I'm finding it so hard to train at home. Yeah. There's nowhere else to train. We we weren't prepared for this, so we have very limited equipment, and like 
on my worst day when I would walk into Gold's and I'm like, oh, I don't have a plan. I'm not following a program. I'm going to like post up on the hammer strength row and I'll just do like two and a half hours of back. <laughs> and it's great. Now, now I have a kettlebell and it weighs 40 pounds. I'm like, how am I going to work? I'm like, I get doing pull-ups on the stairs. And like of all my, like training my back is always the default. I don't feel like thinking session. And now it's like, I have to be very creative and it's stretching me. And so I am, you know, like it's, there's bands on the way and this whole thing, but I'm like doing very, very slow uh, tempo rows, but mostly I'm really, I just, I, I'm at my wits. I'm like, I'm going to buy a hammer strength row machine. And throw it. We'll get rid of the, like we don't need a couch. I'll just do rows. I want, we'll get rid of the one chair. That's like my chair and I'll watch TV doing rows. rows. And that'll be the, I'll just, that'll be it. <laughs> just need four plates aside. We'll be okay. And I will, I will just row during, We'll watch Westworld and I'll do Rose. <laughs> he walks out of lockdown with a gigantic back. <laughs> <laughs> that's it. That's it. We'll just get that's what we need. But that is the big thing. Just like, fuck, avail. Like, to just, and this is, it, it actually really puts into stark relief why I love New York so much. I love yeah. New York because it's the availability of everything at all yes. times. And when nothing is available, yeah. I'm just like, man, I really. I really depended on that. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Like, I think it's to totally, totally allowed. And I, I think it's a cool thing for us to actually have more appreciation of that sort of stuff and be like, whoa, like going to the gym is actually really cool because the gyms did shut down here for a little while. And I was like, like I, I had no equipment. I was getting like those big 20, like. Uh, oh, the water jugs? The, yeah, the water jugs. You know what I mean, I was doing rows with the water jugs and shit. And I'm like. Oh, I'm not made for it. Like, I'm not the I calisthenics home workout to. dude. Like, I don't want to. No, I want to check my phone between sets and <laughs> do the hammer strength. I don't want to have to move quickly to keep my heart rate up. Just the only way to get the workout. <laughs> and at least, at least you're tall. You could, you could do like, a, like a bent over row with a jug. I'd have to stand on something. Like if I'm, <laughs> if I'm fully extended, the, the the jug is still on the ground. I need to. <laughs> <laughs> like, I'm rowing like four inches. So the, wa the water jug workout is not, it's not for Amanda and I. <laughs> <laughs> I, I. I did get the shits with it after about 15 minutes. I was like, all right, that's it. <laughs> I'm just, yeah. just going to lie down now. Um, yeah. Okay, I like this. Um, uh, writing. I, I, how are your books going? Good, good. I actually just got super inspired and I started something and this is me. This is, I just like, I, I like start new projects to avoid the hard work. of <laughs> But I, um, I started working on like a little, like a project about writing and I've mm. been, it, yeah, it just, it just came into my head and was like, there's not a great book about writing for the kind of work that we do. And yeah. this came into my head because I teach these storytelling workshops and they're going really well. And we answer a lot of writer writing questions there. <clears throat> and I often recommend all of the classic writing books uh, on writing well and bird by bird and all these things. And they're all fantastic and they're, they're wonderful. And there have been a, a few people who after attending the workshops, read a few of these books and they come back to me with questions and they say Zinzer from on writing well says not to do this. Stephen King says not to do that. And my answer is always they're absolutely right in a certain context. Mm -hmm. and, and so many of these books are written for people who want to, who are either essayists or prose writers. So it's, it's very, very different. And what I'm really establishing is there's a difference between like journalism and and exposition and prose but what we do really lives in its own universe and its content so there isn't a really great book for writing personality driven content that is intended not only to be a thing unto itself that single piece of content but also fits in a narrative yeah. and takes into account what do these people already know about me what do they already know about the topic and so i'm just defining content in this book as nonfiction writing um, from a place of authority mm -hmm. intended to both teach and move the reader along 
Mm-hmm. And so it's, it's, you know, part exposition, part storytelling, part marketing and part branding. Every piece of content has to fit your voice <clears throat> and move people, not necessarily down a funnel, but, when you write content that is written in, in first person language, very much I, you know, I, I did this, I went here today, your prospect needs to give a shit about you. So mm-hmm. you can't do that all the time unless they have buy-in. Mm-hmm. And then when you write it in second person, which is you I'm talking to you, you go to the store, you go to the gym, when you do this, um, <clears throat> you are writing from a place of authority because you're directing it to the reader, which means you have to, some of your content needs to establish authority for them to receive that. And then when you're writing in third person, which is the omnipotent narrative and it's very much they language, um, that it, that's more just pure storytelling and, and that, but that's less. So most of content is written in first and second person. Mm-hmm. <clears throat> and most of prose is written in third person. And most of exposition is written in, um, uh, you know, sort of the Royal we from, the, mm-hmm. you know, it's an objective narrator. And there's not, there's not a great book out there that teaches people how to write that is simultaneously going to entertain if that's your goal, um, but to, to educate, to inspire and to, to, to create connection. Mm -hmm. And it has to, in some way, feed back into what you do. And so the, the difference between content and journalism or content and, 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 and copy is, you know, you, you're still telling people stuff. They're walking away with value, but at the end of the day, if you're doing it right, they, they want to walk away with the value from you. So it's, it's about identifying your voice and your story and your narrative and doing it in a way that creates um, connection and really makes it exciting to read and keep coming back over and over. And I realized that none of the books that I recommend people read do that effectively. Hmm. And so while all of those are great books for writing the individual type of thing, <clears throat> they're not helping people in the exact way that they need to be helped. And it's as simple as if I were to tell you when you start learning how to edit, to take your piece that you just wrote and put it in Grammarly or the Hemingway app, the rules of those writing softwares Mm -hmm. would have you remove passive voice would have you remove adverbs they would uh, and so many of those are good rules but they can be broken effectively to because writing has to be conversational when you're writing from the first person when you are writing personality driven content that that uh, stands for a person and behind a brand um or for a brand and behind a person it has to be conversational. They need to hear you in their head and you have to write how you speak to some degree. And most of these books tell you not to do that. They want you to develop your writing voice, which is not really your spoken voice. And the, and content really is in the middle of that Venn diagram. So I'm now taking all of my individual lessons on writing and just like throwing them all together, whether it will be an ebook or whether I'll actually just self publish it as a book. Uh, my, my goal is to write it very, very quickly because I have so much of this content. It's less, um, a lot of it is finding right now it's, I'm in the exploratory stage where I'm finding all of these pieces of writing that aren't wrong but within the context of what we do are all the way right. And so it's a lot of yes, and, and yeah, but so finding Mm. things like don't use a lot of adverbs. And then here's why you can do that sometimes and giving people all of the exceptions that, that will bring your voice out. Dude, I absolutely love that. I know. Yeah. There is nothing out there at all that actually talks about to what it is that we do when it comes to that. Um, I immediately think of, uh, I think it was John Carton's like copywriting book. It comes in like a big, thick manual, A4, and it's written in copywriting. Do you know what I mean? So really short, like kind of like what we'd see in Instagram these days. Very conversational. Amazing the way that he like mapped that out. And I feel like I struggle right now with my writing because I want to go down that path. So when I write and 
Uh, it's a great example. Someone asked me, actually, it was a sales guy asked me about uh, one of the new offers that we uh, have just come to market with. And I was like, uh, wait. And I had to go to Evernote and I like I wrote it out in like copy format to then send it to him because I found that I could actually figure it out in my head by doing it that way as well. Like I think better when I write rather than trying to like think it through with myself. Sure. And so where does the balance sit between do you mean I think I want to ask where does the balance sit between writing like a copywriter compared to writing in a narrative book format? So I would typically say that if you are writing content that is going to be uh, is going to live somewhere on the internet, it's like 60 to 75% write how you talk. Yeah. About 25% write how they talk and it's 5% flex on these hoes, which is basically right from a position of extreme authority, whether that is exercise some sort of literary dynamism and, and have some tricks that are like, oh, that's very impressive writing, or whether it is you know, bringing in facts that they didn't know and presenting them in a very intellectual way. But of course, when you are writing for your audience, it, it must be considered Many times, particularly if you are a coach of some kind or a mentor, your audience, your ideal client, the people who are reading your stuff is some version of you five years ago, trying to become who you were two years ago, reading stuff that you as the you of today is creating, which means that the right how you talk and right how they talk, they, there's a lot of overlap there. Yeah. And it's mostly <clears throat> just writing more past tense than present tense and knowing when to shift that. When you're writing copy, it's about 75% write how they talk, yeah. which is figuring out what problems they have and the language they use to describe the experience of those problems. And sometimes that mm -hmm. is difficult when you are past that when you you haven't lived there for all you suffer from the curse of knowledge so the difference between content and copy is that copy is very much writing in their voice how they're experiencing it right now and then projecting it forward like what their life will be like after but it's still that voice mm -hmm. most of the time and content is you're speaking to them uh as you are now to help them to help bring them along so copy content gets or copywriting gets sandwiched between two pieces of content, right? Yes. So if you think about it, the content is giving them information that makes them want to like listen in on the, the offer. Yeah. And then it's also the thing that helps reassure them that like you're still there for them afterward. Yep. So a piece of copy gets sandwiched in, in between two pieces of, of content. It's the, the content is the stuff that like helps continue to educate them whether or not they take the offer, whether or not they, they read the copy and they still feel good about it. And if you're good, copywriting you know, doesn't make you feel shitty even though when it presses on pain. Yep. It's about exploring what their life could be like if they solve this problem. And, uh, you know, and, and it's, it's all nuance, but the yeah. big thing that people, uh, where people fuck up is they, they often write content like it's copy. And yes. That's the problem. Yes. Yes. When you're right, when you're exclusively writing like it's copy, you always sound like a salesman. Yes. There's a, there's a very, very big difference of having a conversation with someone at dinner and speaking to a room of people from a stage mm. and often uh, having a conversation with someone at dinner is a better way to sell someone. But if you have that conversation, like you're speaking to them from the stage, mm. they're going to be like, dude, why are you just, just, I'm a person just, you know, like take stop. Down. <laughs> right. um, and it, it's, it's just really different. So the, the voice and the words and the tone change, but what really changes is the structure and the, the setup. Dude, that was an amazing answer to a very <laughs> shitty question. That was, <laughs> I could listen to you all day. That's really good. Okay. But personally, I knew getting onto this chat, right? Um, and you said something before that uh, re-brought this thought up. 
you said you wanted to write it really quickly. Um, how does that look? So it's it, most of when I am writing slowly, it's, um, it's, it's very, it's much harder to be proactive than it is to be reactive. And this is a great, this is a great writing tip for anyone who wants to write something. If you are going to sit down and write something and you're like, okay, the topic I'm going to write about is sales uh, or, or like how to, how to close people, like what, what to do, how to handle objections on the phone. Um, that is, it's narrow, but it's still very broad. And the easiest way for you to make it even narrower is to just tell someone on your staff, like, ask, ask me questions about how I do it. And the more specific they make those questions, the easier it is for you to answer because it's very reactive. It's super easy to be reactive. And so the way, the way that I'm writing this book is, firstly, it's, it's a lot of, it's not as much um, creation as it is uh, collation because I have so much of this stuff on writing and often I'll just need to write an intro paragraph that is like, this is the specific problem. This is the reason you do this. Uh, and also the way I'm looking at the book is it doesn't need to be long chapters. Most of the books on writing that I love the most, sometimes the chapters are three paragraph long. And mm. as opposed to when you're writing a business book mm. and it's like 15 chapters and each one is like an essay and it has a thesis. When you read a writing book, it could have like 35 chapters and each one is just like, do this, don't do this, move on to the next thing. And so it's a lot of collation and taking stuff I already have and, and putting it together. And then it's a lot of the writing is reactive, which allows me to move more quickly. And so it's taking a piece of <clears throat> writing advice and arguing against it or expanding on it. And a great, uh, a great piece of writing advice that we hear all the time is write drunk, edit sober. <laughs> and it's contextualizing that. Write drunk, edit sober is great writing advice. And the reason it's great writing advice is not just because writers are alcoholics and we like drinking. <laughs> writing, writing by its nature is, is difficult. And it, it can be made easier. And the reason that writing is so difficult is because of <clears throat> what Stephen Pressfield calls resistance. Which, is, which really comes down to self-judgment. You're judging what's coming up on the page as you're doing it. And that creates inhibition. And anyone who's ever taken a couple of shots at a bar knows that the cure for inhibition is inebriation. It's much easier to do something when you have a little liquid courage. Oh, yeah. Within the context of writing, it doesn't need to be alcohol. So when I say, when I tell people write drunk and it's sober, it's you can be drunk Yes, you, but you could be drunk on anger. You could be drunk on glory. You could be drunk on happiness. You just need to get into a heightened state of emotional arousal. Mm. And to teach that lesson, I, think, I tell people, think about the last time you got in a fight with someone and how much easier was it when you were angry mm. to say the things that had been bottled up. And sometimes there's resistance even in that moment, but then the next day when you think about the fight, you're like, Oh, I should have said that. <laughs> and it's, like, it's like, yeah, that Seinfeld moment. But what that is, and, and you know, like when you are, <clears throat> when you're really intimate with someone and like, how easy is it to be silly with your daughters, mm. to, to do mm. voices and mm. there's no, there's no inhibition. It's mm. all easy to mm. come out. Uh, so the goal with the way I teach right drunk edit sober, it's not get really drunk. It's figure out the way that you can lower your inhibition because that will allow you to write more quickly. So whether it's drunk in love or drunk on anger, like yeah, get angry, write about things that like just sit and seethe, get angry and then just fucking type or get inspired, get, um, you know, a, a big tip that I, or a practice that I have is I like to go and go on YouTube and I find snippets from movies that I like. It's like that speech right before the big game in any, in any sports movie, like that gets me amped up and now I'm ready to go. I listen to music that gets me amped up. The goal is not to allow me to write more, to, to write more um, qualitatively. It's mm -hmm. more quantitatively. Mm -hmm. I, I'm at the point where I'd rather get more words on the page faster and go back and edit them. Uh, and so, you know, just getting out of your own way. So taking something like write drunk, edit sober and breaking it down to 
don't just become an alcoholic because there's a point of diminishing returns when that stops working. Mm. But here's what that means in the context of being able to write effectively. Mm -hmm. And so to me, that's still, it's reactive because I'm taking something that already exists in the world and is relatively well known, like the aphorism, write drunk, edit sober. And I'm just giving my perspective on it and breaking it down and I'm inverting the thought process around it. Or another piece of advice you hear a lot is write what you know. Write what you know is often misconstrued or conflated with write what you love. <clears throat> and while that's not bad, if you're trying to improve as a writer, write what you love is bad advice because you are going to, when you write anything, you are attached to the, the content to the craft and to the creation of it. And uh, the content, when you're writing about the things you love, whether it's your first love, whether it's your family, it's very difficult for you to accept feedback on that and to improve because every, you know, it's like, well, this was my first great love. Every word in that story is important. So you can't accept feedback on the craft. So when I help people write, uh. I, you know, the goal at first is to become a good enough writer to start writing what you love. So write what you know and don't give a fuck about is better advice. Nobody knows your morning routine better than you, but nobody cares less about it than you. And so if I tell you to write your morning routine in the most evocative, beautiful way possible, then we can, then you can go back and just edit the the words you can make it mechanically better because you have no emotional tie to the content and so the way that i'm writing this book is very much taking all of these pieces of writing advice that i often get asked about or you know stephen king says not to use adverbs which are anything that modifies a verb like really definitely surprisingly uh and explaining there are times when to sound conversational you need to do that there are times when using passive voice is um is is the best way to write the sentence and one of my favorite sentences of all time is written in the passive voice it's from uh chopsky's the, per the perks of being a wallflower and it's in that moment i swear we were infinite um where if you were to write that in active voice, it would be, I swear we were infinite in that moment. Mm. Um, and it just, it passive mm. voice adds, you can use it effectively to add suspense to the end mm. of the sentence you can mm. build. And so all of the things that you're told not to do, I am, you know, when, when I disagree with them or when I feel like in context, they can be used. It's, this is a guide on how to write for consumption in 2020 and beyond. It's to write content that is for a personal brand and how to break all of these rules and do it in a way that makes your writing better and the context under which to do that. So when I say I'm writing it quickly, it's very easy for me to, it's, it's hard for me, it's as hard for me as anyone else to sit down and look at a blank page and be like, what should I write about writing? <laughs> but it's much easier if I go through all of these writing books and I'm like, oh, here's the thing I disagree with. And then I can spit out 2000 words on the context under which I disagree with it or, or would expand on it and then go back and edit it later. So, it's, so reactive writing is, is significantly easier. Mm. Pro and and all of journalism is reactive. It's why journalists are able to write so quickly. These things happened. I don't need to be creative. I just need to tell you what they, what what happened in order, when and where. And it's uh, it's a really exciting thing to be able to do. It's been so long since I've been able to just churn out a thousand words in a sitting without without missing a beat. And to have done that for the past few days in a row, feeling no, that's good. dude, nice. I like that. Okay, that's really cool. Um, okay. <laughs> Uh, me being my selfish self, uh, what would you say to me that I need to do? Well, you are a great storyteller um, because you, you've you learned the art form of documentary filmmaking. And that is, it's, it's the only, I, I love documentary because it is the, it's a nonfiction form which allows you to Tarantino things. Mm. And you can, often you can tell stories out of sequence, mm. which is really, really interesting. You know, you mm. start with this really exciting moment to get people to buy in and then you, you spend time in that 
uh, you know, that scene, whatever it is, and then you move to something else that tells the broader story. And then later you go back and show something from the past that contextualizes it. And that's- can, can I ask you a super quick question, John? Did you, yeah. did you like Once Upon a Time in Hollywood? I lo- I, it was, I, it's Tarantino. It's, it was oh, so good. It's, it's so fucking good. It's, it's <laughs> so good. I mean, it's, uh, I mean, everything from the wardrobe to the coloring on the film, yeah. to the acting and I just, just truly beautiful, right? Like, so within that movie, you have a flashback inside of a flashback yeah. that snaps back to the present oh. and it just is great. And it's, it's really, um, now I think is, a, is such an interesting time to watch that movie. It's such a perfect time because when you watch a period piece, you're, mm. you're watching a nostalgized version of someone's memory of that place and time. And so when we're outside of the, you know, the historical liberties that were taken with the, the Manson murders and everything, when we're, when we're exploring Hollywood, when we're seeing that version of Hollywood, it's not historical. It's not, it's not objective. It's subjective. Mm-hmm. It's, it's Tarantino's fantasy of Hollywood. And it's very much, you know, it, it and the greatest type of subjective material is when, when it's nostalgized and it's, it's, you're looking at a, a version of Hollywood that probably never was, but absolutely feels like it might have been. And I think right now when we're in this pandemic and so many things are going to change, like the New York that I go back to, yeah. Like is it at first when it first wakes up, it's going to be whatever it is, but you know, let's, let's assume that, you know, we're, we're recording this on, on April 15th of 2020. Let's assume that things get back to whatever's going to pass for normal by September 15th of 2020. And then we have until the, we have the rest of 2020 for picking up the pieces and figuring it out. Fast forwarding to April 15th of 2021, um, the New York of now and or whatever it was isn't going to be the same. I I read this really uh, just devastating and beautiful article in the New York Times about David Chang, who is a restaurateur in New York who is mm-hmm. known for Momofuku mm-hmm. um, and and all of the you know its sister restaurants. And he talks about how we were, we've been in this unbelievable ascendant food culture mm. across the world for so long. And now with something like this happens, mm. like restaurants can't afford to not operate for four months. Most small businesses mm. can't, but, but restaurants in particular, especially in New York, the rents are, are mm. exorbitant. And what happens? What happens? Okay, rent is frozen now. There's no mandatory evictions. But restaurants have a it's like a 10% survival rate the first year under the best of conditions. 10% of restaurants under the best of conditions survive their first year. And so now you have the absolute worst conditions in the world, which even when things open back up, they're going to owe back rent. And even if that rent was, is forgiven, you're looking at an industry that requires people to gather in large groups at a time when people might be afraid to do that. And so this, this burgeoning food scene in New York and cities like it, might cease to exist. And he said something that was only a, it's a truly chilling sentence. If you're a person who loves New York and food and food culture he said like the only restaurants that can survive are chain restaurants. Mm. Like the, the amount you go to New York and it's, there's some of the greatest food experiences in the world, hole in the walls, mm. you know, the, uh, holes in the wall from these like little, but you go, the idea of going there and the only thing that's left is fucking Applebee's <laughs> is terrifying. It's yeah. jarring. And I hate that saying that makes me sound like a replete food snob and it just a snob in general, but that's, it's food is more than food. It's culture. It's how we express ourselves and what we put out for the, the world to consume about our culture and our people. And, and if you go to New York and you didn't have a bagel and pizza, then you didn't really go to New York. And, you know, I would much rather people come to my city and show them around and, and, and expose them to food than take them to the top of the empire state building. Yeah. And do, you know, it's, so there's all this stuff. And, uh, and, and when we're talking about once upon a time in Hollywood, <clears throat> that is, you know, whatever, whatever movies get made from here on are going to be reflective of the writer and director's crystallized, 
fantasy of whatever New York was before this happened. And then 20 years from now, we are going to see new filmmakers making their version of movies about whatever New York becomes. And mm. so everything in the, in the storytelling mediums, it's going to change. And it's, mm. it, you know, and one of the things I want to do, um, that I was planning on doing this week is making a list of movies, like quintessential New York movies that would help you see like, what was New York like in the seventies? Like, uh, so if you're, if you're a comedy fan watching the fabulous Mrs. Maisel, marvelous mm. Mrs. Maisel on Amazon, it's like a great way to get to know like the Jewish New York comedy scene in the fifties and sixties. And then New York in the seventies, like very Woody Allen. And then there's New York in the late seventies into the eighties, which was very like very punk rock heavy and dangerous and crazy and then you get into the 90s and things start to change and, and all of the the different iterations of this city in which I grew up or in the shadow of which I grew up uh, are, are caught on film because it's some person's experience of that city used as a backdrop and not just because like where should we set this you know i, I don't want to include movies on this list that are set in new york because like it's cool or it's like mm. yeah why not uh, let's just put it but movies that are in new york because they need to be in new york because mm. it's a person's love letter to the city the way that uh once upon a time in hollywood was tarantino's love letter to hollywood and those are the types of movies that i that i love and and i I want people to experience more of it's the type of books that I love reading uh, in, in just a kind of button in terms of nostalgia. If you haven't read, and by you, I mean, not only you, Chris, but anyone listening to this, mm. if you haven't read um, ready player one. No, I, I haven't. Everyone do that. It's, it's a good movie. It's worth seeing, but I would read the book first oh. because oh. it is, it's crystallized nostalgia. It is, it, it, it's a love letter to our generation <clears throat> filled with references to the breakfast club, but also to Atari and Contra and games from, you know, just like what it was like to grow up in the pre-digital era. Mm. And it's, it, you know, it, it's so, um, I mean, it, the, it's so emphatic it, it borders on the masturbatory but it really is it's a cool story and and everything about it is it's worth reading and i think that we're going to see so many pieces of art and so many types of stories come out about this time and new york was changing it's been changing it's a gilded city now it's highly gentrified gentrified it's not like back in the day when the village was all arts and, uh, you know, and, and, um, and dive bars. Now it's all townhomes, but uh, uh, thank you for letting me go on at length about my love for New York and, and all the things related. Oh, I love it, dude. It's and great. I, it's... I, hope, I hope, I hope that wherever people live, I hope that they love their city as much as New Yorkers love New York. And uh, I don't see that. I don't, I don't see that. And that's something I've always found very interesting because every time I go to New York, it's always such an eye-opening experience. And I love seeing people love where they live um, because we've, I'm going to be perfectly honest, for I left, I left Sydney to move to Dubai uh, eight years ago. And doing, I didn't love Dubai, like living there as the actual city. We were there for two years and left, and then we've come to Bali, and it's always felt temporary. It's never felt like truly I put a stake in the ground and like this is where we've been, and because we've travelled and come here and there, and then we're doing bought property in Australia, and so we've got a, like a great place in uh, doing in Noosa, and yeah, I've never felt that. And so when I see people, and I especially like watch you talk about New York, I'm like. I'm like, oh my God, like there's, there's true beauty behind that and something I think is very important for us to be able to have. So uh, it inspires me to want that. Thank you. Yeah, I, I, Amanda and I have been talking about this. There are some cities in, in the States in particular that love themselves and their people. Like Austin loves Austin. Yeah. Oakland loves Oakland. Portland loves Portland. New Yorkers love New York. I, it's, there's a great kind of thing. It's like New York doesn't love New Yorkers. New York needs New Yorkers to function. <laughs> but it's like there's this whole, if you search like New York doesn't care about you, there's a great series of essays from different writers that just like New York doesn't give a fuck about you, which is it's like an abusive relationship. Like you leave, New York doesn't care. But the people who you love in New York, they miss you and they want. And it's, like, it's, just such, it's such a welcoming city. 
and it's like you just have the it's the craziest most beautiful thing and everyone's on top of each other which is why the disease has spread so rapidly yeah. there just, you know like 10,000 people have died and uh, and I hope we get it under control soon it's it's challenging to even think about it yeah New York, you know New York isn't New York no I'm out here in LA mm. and just seeing seeing videos on Instagram from my friends just filming these empty streets it's like wow what made new york special was it two things it's everything that's available and all of the things that have been built to service the people mm. but also the people there mm. and without them it's nothing it's just buildings and uh you know the spirit of a city lives in, in the hearts of all of its people and new yorkers have really really magnificent hearts and i I hope everyone like, gets to fall in love with anything or any place that they see that they li like as, as much as I love New York. Dude, I absolutely love that. Okay. Um, I want to be super respectful of your time. Um, so I'm going to be a prick and ask a selfish question again. Um, <clears throat> love, like, so the documentary came out, I don't know, like a week ago. Um, love the process of going through that. And then I was thinking about, uh, am I being a dick and procrastinating about writing this next book because I'm procrastinating, procrastinating about writing the book or do I not want to do it and do I want to move on because I want to do the next documentary series? How do I determine, how do I choose? And I come to you as a mentor and a friend and someone that is much wiser than me. <laughs> I I would say I would certainly say I'm I'm no wiser than anyone, especially at least at least not when it comes to their own life. Like everyone, everyone <laughs> is, everybody is incredibly wise for other people. You know, we are all. It's really easy to just because we have objectivity, there's neutrality. Yeah. So I, I think that the question you're asking, and it's a, you're you're applying it to you, which I do not think is at all selfish, but to make it somewhat beneficial for everybody. Yeah. It's at some point you will find yourself in a position where you are in uh, a type of transitional arc. Mm -hmm. And the question becomes like, should I do this thing and close out the arc or do I just move on to the next thing? Like, mm -hmm. And so the question I think for yourself is, does it feel like you're leaving something on the table mm -hmm. by not doing it? And I, I Fuck, you're in, good. Um, and it doesn't and and the thing doesn't have to be money it's not like well if i write the book then i make this money or whatever but it's like, do you feel like you're you're leaving something unsaid mm -hmm. and there's something unfinished and then you have to weigh that more conceptual and emotional stuff against the practical questions like how long is it going to take how much is already done you know there's some things you, you do because you're like you know what? it's 80 percent fucking finished and like let me just get it done because it's I have the time right now. And even if I don't care that much about it, it's like, I want to get some sort of return on that investment, but that can be, that can be a trap, you know? And then you also have to think we are all as, uh, we, we are all somewhat bound by the public perception of us with regard to how our brands move. And, you know, I, I probably have two or three different fitness books between 60 and 95% done on my computer that were just like different things. And I, you know, eat things that would be easy to finish, but I would not personally publish any of them because publishing something in 2020 or 2021 that ties me to an industry I have left behind doesn't do anything for me. It actually, it, there's no amount of money I could make from that that would in some way uh, supersede that I was my brand was t taking a step backwards, and I was I'd be further tied to an industry I've long left behind. Yep. And with this book, are you avoiding it because, like, yeah, you're just in the in the procrastinative, um, just you know, like the the thing that writers do, where it's just like we avoid writing, uh, or are you are you really like done with that part of your career and? Uh, and if you're, if you're not done with the part of your career, if it's just like the documentary is more exciting to me right now and it's fun and I like the form, then I would say write the book. I would say, yeah. you know, if, if, if it's going to support everything else you're doing, yeah. write the book. Yeah. If it's going to tie you to something, if, if like 
if in 2025, you're going to look back and be like, oh, I wish that I had written that book in 2016 instead of 2020, then, you know, possibly not. But I, I think that um, you have to negotiate whether you're leaving something on the table by not writing it or if it's more important to you to like leave it on the field to use a football uh, reference by writing it. And the big thing, if from my own experience with, with Alpha, the reason that the second book never came about outside of just like wanting to part ways with our publisher, you know, we signed a two book deal, Adam and I for oh. engineering the Alpha. Yeah. Was that like, like we, like I, I really like left it all on the field, you know, like I yeah. said what I needed to say. I'd yeah. written a couple of hundred articles, a best selling book. It was, and I wasn't learning more. And I was like, I'm just going to say the same thing mm -hmm. like, in different ways. Mm -hmm. I, I had done enough of that and I wanted to move on to something else. And like, yeah, I could have found a dozen different ways to create like low price eBooks and just have them in the store, but it wasn't appealing. Okay. So no, no, I've, I've made the decision. Your question, your first question was, do you mean, am I leaving something on the table? And the immediate answer to my head was yes. Do you mean like it's, it is something here. And I also think of the context of where we are in the world right now. Like I'm here in home. Do you know what I mean? Like I have the time. I also don't know when I can start traveling again and start shooting interviews. Do you know what I mean? So like, I was like, I don't know when I can actually start shooting the next set of interviews for the documentary series. So I was like, well, I also in my head, and this could be a limiting belief, but in my head right now, I'm like, well, if something's really far away, I don't want to be working on it now because there'll be changes that will happen as well. So, okay, I'm going to write it now. Okay. Yeah, I think, I, and I think that it's, you're in a really good spot. This is an exciting thing for anyone listening to this. Like, if you are in some way impeded by what's happening in the world that it, to the extent that you don't get to do this project that you wanted and you are fortunate enough by virtue of your business setup, by virtue of planning, by virtue of happenstance or circumstance or sheer dumb luck, if you are fortunate enough to have this other project you could use to fill your time. Yeah. Every now and again, things fall into your lap, you know, yeah. and the universe like lines up a shot for you. And yeah. You don't have to take it, but it doesn't, doesn't hurt. You know, you get to do it. It's cool. No, I appreciate that. John, you're amazing. Um, uh, all right. For everyone listening and watching, where do they go to now to get more of the amazing Mr. Roman Mellon? Just go, go to the Instagrams, go to the Instagrams. That's where I hang out. I'm, I do, I'm still, I'm, I'm posting some stuff on Facebook now because Instagram uh, character limit is, is inhibitive sometimes when I'm ranting, but uh, yeah, um, I, I don't have anything to sell you. Um, I'm do, depending on when you listen to this, I'm doing a storytelling workshop, a, a masterclass that's online. So uh, when is this going to come out, Chris? Next week. Oh, all right. So I will. I won't have done it yet. So I will. Uh, I will. Um, I will be announcing it next week, and it will be happening uh, second week of May, I believe. And okay. So it's going to be. Um, it's going to be a, a three and a half hour masterclass where we go over all the great stuff about storytelling. So if you're interested in that, um, the URL, which may or may not be active by the time you listen to this, is just johnromanello.com <clears throat> slash stories dash at dash home stories at home and um so it'll be yeah be an online masterclass, and we're gonna do some fun stuff so it'll be through zoom it'll be live you get to ask questions you get to learn um and if you want to write drunk and edit sober that's a good place to do it beyond that okay. just d dm me and i'm always down to hang out amazing all right i'll put in the uh, show notes the links to that as well <laughs> so that people can click directly off to that and make that super easy john um i appreciate you so much dude um the times that we always connect, I always walk away a better human being. And I've got to be honest, I really appreciate it. And I really appreciate you. Um, I really thought about uh, a little while ago, uh, like my journal sitting next to me here. And I was like, one thing I think is really uh, potential and important, uh, especially in a time of now that what we're going through in the world is to question everything. And I was like, I wanted to question everything. What do I want to achieve? What are the labels that I want to put upon myself? Like, what's the story that I'm telling myself? Like all of these things that I started going through and I got to one point and it was like, who are the relationships that I want in my life? Um, and you were one that doing came immediately to the top of the list because doing, I always feel uh, inspired, better, just 
just as a greater human being at the end of the day. And it was funny when I wrote that down because I was like, I really want others to be able to have that in their life. Um, so, dude, I appreciate you. Thank you so much. Thank you. I feel the same. I appreciate you. Thank you for exposing me to your audience and vice versa. And uh, just do what you do in the world, man. Just keep, you know, keep putting the stuff that you do out there because all of the make money content that we create, all the build your business content, you know, that, that helps a lot of people now. But what I would love for you to remember is that the stuff that you do at home, like there are, there are 23-year-old guys watching your stuff watching an hour stuff who, who don't realize that like just subliminally what's what they're absorbing is seeing you be a good dad and seeing you show up for your kids. And that stuff is so tremendously important because they're going to, they're going to get the thing that they think they want from you right now. And they're going to learn how to build money and build these fitness businesses. <clears throat> but like just seeing and, and, and absorbing through osmosis, the, the like being a good dad and showing up for your kids and consistently like loving on your children, the stuff that so many people in their own lives didn't get and didn't have a model for. Like, I don't think it's our job or responsibility to teach, you know, anyone how to do anything other than what we, what we want, but you, it's a great opportunity. And like, I like watching you with your kids. I like seeing, the, the fun that you have with them. I, I, I love the pictures that you post with your daughters. And uh, I, I personally still subscribe to the belief that like nobody cares about, nobody gives a shit about your kids. Mm. Like I believe that's true. Mm. Um, Cause your kids aren't, they're not like most of the time they're not entertaining content, but they care about you. Yeah. And seeing you be a dad is, it, it's slow. It sinks into their subconscious and that's really important. And the more I'm at home for hours on a, at a time and seeing other people do the same, the more I'm like, yeah, people are like, they're watching. And this is, a, it's a really formative time right now. And I think it's really, um, you know, the generation that survives this, the, the 16 year olds right now who are stuck at home with their parents. That, imagine being 16 right now. That has to be the worst. Yeah, dude, like yeah, if, dude. You, if you're like, 10 right now it doesn't suck that bad if you're 30 right now it doesn't suck but if you're between like 14 and 26 and you're living at home with your parents this is real fucking hard for you and i feel like. <laughs> but um it's the worst uh but i just want to say like i like all of the the dad stuff and it's cool to just you know keep putting it out there so thank you brother i appreciate that and it's um it is definitely something that's important to me um it's definitely something that I'm learning on an everyday basis and continually fuck up on digitally as well. And yeah. it's been super interesting going through like this and juggling, well, how do I show up for my business? How do I do what I need to do? How do I still be a good husband? How do I still be a good father? Like we're homeschooling now. Like how does that fall into the mix? And um, especially like having a, a six-year-old, a four-year-old and Rooney's 11 months old now. Um, it, it's like, I was saying to Lauren, I was like, there's a lot of cogs in the machine. Do you know what I mean? Like there's just, there's a lot of things that we have to think about now when it comes to it. So it's been super interesting and by no means do I know what I'm actually doing. So I'm making it up, but I appreciate that. Thank you, John. Good. Well, you seem, it, it seems like nobody's died or burned the house down. So, so far, right so, good. So, far <laughs> so good. So far, so good. All right, man. Thank you for the, uh, for the conversation. And uh, I'm going to go walk these dogs. And if you need anything, let me know, but I'll talk Th to you soon. Thank you, brother. Au revoir.